Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. This is the show where we relive and retell true scary stories submitted by subscribers such as yourselves. I figured since winter is about to end, we'd end it the right way with some scary winter stories that are going to chill you to the bone. I want to give a huge thank you to Swamp Dweller who joined me on today's episode. Make sure to go show him some love if you're not already subscribed to him and tell him the creepy fox sent you. But yeah, make sure to sit back, relax, grab yourselves some blankets and maybe even some hot cocoa. And let's go ahead and get started with today's episode. Enjoy. The Footprints in the Snow This happened on a Friday evening, a week ago. To set the scene, I live in Buffalo, New York, and if anyone knows anything about here, it's that we get a lot of snow. So I would shovel for my four neighbors. Whenever it was going to snow overnight, I'd stay up to go for a late night shoveling session. This would limit my load for the mornings and actually help me get some extra cash while I'm at it. I know it sounds kind of messed up, but hey, it works. As I put on my Nike ski mask to protect me from the cold, I walked out into the street to cross the road over to my neighbor's home to start shoveling. The snow was coming down hard, and the wind didn't help me whatsoever in what was sure to be another typical night of shoveling. It was super quiet, calming. There was just something so peaceful about being alone in a blizzard at night. I remember I looked down the road to check for cars, and about a football field's distance away, a man, in all black, was walking. Now, thanks to the lake effect of the snow, I couldn't exactly tell if he was walking toward me or away. Now, nothing happened while I was shoveling, except seeing the occasional neighbor in the window on their computer with a nice cup of hot cocoa by a warm fire. While I was walking back to place the shovel in the garage, I had to do this because of the increasing crime in the neighborhood. I could have sworn I saw something, or better yet, someone running in my backyard toward my neighbor's backyard. We don't have a fence connecting my home to my neighbor's because of the woods in my backyard, so I had to assume it was some deer or raccoon because nobody would be out at this hour and at this temperature. I remember I made it a point to walk into my home fast. You see, my family members would be gone for the evening because of my sister's dance tournament. So I used this as a perfect opportunity to pick up a pizza and listen to the Creepy Fox and Mr. Nightmare. It was 11.30pm now, and I was by my fireplace with a cup of hot cocoa, reading Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. And that's when I hear a tapping at the window. What was worse is when I realized the tapping was consistent. I texted my buddy across the street to come over to chill and check it out, and he did. My friend Jason came over and actually looked pretty concerned. Jason said he saw footprints at the side of my house, leading into the backyard. He followed these footsteps, and it led him to the back of some tree, and that's what it led up to. I remember I invited him to stay the evening, but of course Jason didn't want to. When Jason left at around 1.45am, I heard a knock. Then, two knocks, then pounding at my back door. I freaked out, and I hid in my closet with three blankets over my head as I phoned the police. About five minutes later, I heard from the front door, Police! I rushed from my cozy hiding spot to greet the officers, as I noticed something bizarre. There were no cop cars in the near area. I remember I went back to my hiding spot, and that's when I heard a huge bang on the front door. When the police actually showed up, they escorted me and searched the area, but absolutely nothing. The footprints, however, ended in the woods, and the only thing besides the footprints was an axe that was chopped into my door, as well as a poor deceased rat at my front door step. Now, since then, I have been on edge for a while. We recently installed a home security system and I've made it a point to never shovel in the evening, ever again. It was Christmas 2008, 
and I had awoken to a bright, sunny Southern California day. Excited, full of energy, and full of emotions prepared to head toward LAX so I could board my plane and fly across the country. That year, I was heading toward West Virginia to spend the holidays with friends and family. We would proceed to stay up every night watching movies, playing video games, and telling stories during my vacation there. I would go into more details with the fun and exciting things, including going ice skating, camping, and even feeding some deer in my friend's backyard, but I'm pretty sure you are not really interested in all that. Fair enough. Let us focus on the events leading up to my scary encounter, including the experience itself. Now, the reason I chose to fly on Christmas Day was because it was way cheaper. Which, fun fact, if you travel during the season, choose the 25th. As you know, most families want to already be together on Christmas Day, which is why airlines choose the lower cost for customers on the holiday. Just an FYI. Anyways, I boarded my American Airlines flight at approximately 9 in the morning, and we took off close to around 9.45. The flight itself was boring, consisting of listening to audiobooks and having small conversations with a friendly woman who sat behind me. Fast forward to a little past 7 p.m., you must remember there is a three-hour time difference between the East and West Coast time. We arrived at the airport on schedule. It had been snowing that evening, so I bundled up in extra layers with my comfortable boots, softening each of my steps. Once I grabbed my luggage, consisting of my carry-on and small suitcase, I head toward the shuttle system just outside the airport, which was to take me roughly an hour toward the small town that my friend lives in and dropped me off at her mom and dad's bakery. We had planned it this way because my friend, who in this story we'll refer to as Amanda, and her dad would be at the bakery working on some sweets for all of us to enjoy back at her house. Do not get me wrong, they did offer to come pick me up at the airport, and they insisted heavily that it was not an issue, but I insisted further that I would take a shuttle to them. So I did, and about an hour later, I am dropped off at my friend's bakery, and I am greeted by Amanda. Where's your dad? Is it just you? I asked Amanda, as she helps me get the snow-covered suitcase and carry-on into the back room. Oh, he'll be right back. He went to go get some things from home. We proceeded to settle down inside the back room and talked for about 15 minutes or so, catching up and me telling her about my flight. Bear in mind, the lights in front of the bakery, where all the suites are, including the cash register and displays are off, and the We Are Open sign is set to closed. So... Anyways, as we are talking, enjoying some cookies and milk, we suddenly heard a loud thud and shattering coming from the main lobby. Amanda and I quickly jump out of our seats and then storm through the kitchen door only to be met with one of the worst sights you could possibly imagine. Two hunky large figures with black ski masks covering their face, black sweaters, matching pants, gloves, and boots are now in the bakery and are armed. One has a crowbar and the other has a handgun. I remember everything in slow motion, my life passing before my very own eyes. As the men tell us to be quiet and to show them where the money was located, otherwise we would be in a world of trouble, Amanda tells the men the cash register was empty, but the money was in the back room and placed inside a box. The men approached Amanda and I, and we had briefly headed into the back room, Amanda pointing at said money box placed on a table, while the men have their backs turned toward us. We take this opportunity to book it out of the bakery, jumping through the shattered front window and running across the street to a small shopping center. Naturally, everything was closed. It was Christmas after all, so the overall feeling of being isolated without anyone near us for help as it snowed in the darkness was a very real and very scary feeling. Amanda and I both hid behind a large dumpster, keeping a watchful eye on the shop. As Amanda called her dad to warn him about the two armed men, her dad asks us if we are safe. We assure him that we are fine and we are hidden behind a dumpster on the other side of the street. Amanda's dad then advises us to call the police. He then says he would be there in about five minutes with the shotgun. Too bad he did not get there in time, nor did the police, because almost as soon as we are on the line with 911, the two men come racing out of the bakery with the money box I mentioned and run in the complete opposite direction into an alleged alleyway. Twenty seconds later, a black minivan which we assumed housed the two robbers was storming down the street and disappears into the cold, 
dark West Virginia night. Sadly for Amanda and her family, they ended up losing a few thousand dollars that evening, having to cover costs for the damages and the money stolen. But when all was said and done, they were just so thankful nothing bad happened to either me or their daughter. Nothing was stolen from my belongings, which I was thankful for, as I had all their gifts wrapped neatly in my suitcase. Now, even though we stayed at the bakery longer than expected talking with the police and filing a police report, we eventually returned to Amanda's house at roughly 2 in the morning to open presents and try to get our minds off of what was truly the most frightening experiences of our lives. The police never did catch the men, but in what was perhaps one of the greatest acts of kindness, the town folks came together to help raise the funds for Amanda's family to cover the losses from that cold and scary Christmas evening. Out by the Frozen Lake To preface this story, it's coming to you from a 24-year-old female. This was in February of 2018, when I had gone to visit my aunt and uncle, who live all the way up in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm from Georgia originally, by the way, so just to get there was quite the adventure. Now, one of the reasons, or should I say, the main reason I went to visit my family was because I was trying to get over a bad breakup from an ex that I was dating a couple of years ago. Without getting into too much detail, basically he was very controlling and pretty toxic, but that's since behind me. In total, I stayed with my aunt and uncle for three weeks. It had been snowing quite a lot during my stay, which I absolutely adored. If we weren't out traveling somewhere, we went to places like Seward, Alieska, and Fairbanks. I would find myself just sitting next to the chimney with a nice cup of hot cocoa, looking out the window, and watching the snowfall. There's just something very calming and soothing about that. Well, on one early morning, my uncle woke me up and asked if I wanted to join him on his trip to Palmer, where he was going to meet up with a friend and deliver some firewood. I agreed, seeing as I wanted to get out of the house anyways, and we proceeded to spend the roughly four hours of sunlight driving, visiting his friend, and doing a little sightseeing. Now, something I have yet to bring up that I was also doing along with my stay in Alaska was filming and taking lots of pictures. You see, I've always been an avid photographer, at least I like to refer to myself as such, so when I got the opportunity, I would do filming. It's actually similar to some of the things the Creepy Fox has posted in his previous videos. Just taking film of the mountains, landscapes, woods, snow, etc. Anyways, about an hour before sunset, we decided to stop along the way at a McDonald's to grab some chicken nuggets and french fries for the almost hour drive back home. Once back on the road, my uncle mentioned there was this really beautiful frozen lake coming up in the next few miles that offered a really amazing view in the afternoons as the sun hit the horizon in the snow. He mentioned since I was doing some filming anyways, this make a great portfolio shot. I took him up on the offer, seeing as I hadn't really taken video or photographs of a frozen lake, and thus we take an exit that sees us stopping at a little rest area. I call it a rest area, but basically it's just this little restroom building at the side of the road, with a trail you walk on for about three miles, where you reach the frozen lake. So my uncle and I step out of his truck, a light snow falling and breeze passing through my blonde hair, and we begin the walk toward the lake, snow crunching with each and every step. The frozen lake was absolutely gorgeous. It seemed to go on for miles and miles, as the golden orange and yellow lights of the sunset mixed in with the cool winter's colors that were the mountains and the snow. I quickly took out my camera, and I began to take various pictures and videos, making sure to pay perfect attention to the sunset itself. After roughly seven to eight minutes of filming and photography in the almost 20 degree weather, my uncle tells me he needed to use the restroom real quick. I remember telling him I just wanted to take a few more pictures, selfies to be exact, and then he tells me he'd wait for me. I took a look at his face and I could see that he really needed to use the restroom really badly. That's why I proceed to counter by saying, I'm a big girl, and he doesn't have to worry about leaving me out here on my own in the snow, 
since he's just a short walk away anyways, and there's still sunlight left. After a 30 second speech of how I'm responsible and essentially this grown adult, my uncle, reluctantly, turns to walk away and tells me to be quick. Oh, trust me, things went quick all right, but for all the wrong reasons. After about two or three minutes since he had left me, I was just standing there trying to share some video to my Snapchat friends so they can watch what I was doing. Spoiler alert, the videos didn't go through, as the signal was spotty at best. Suddenly, I heard footsteps and snow crunching, and what sounds like whispers coming from the nearby tree line. Now, as far as I knew, and that I was aware of, it's just my uncle and I out here, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. So lo and behold, to my surprise, walked out two men, bundled up in their heavy coats, snow pants, and boots. One was holding a hatchet, and both had this really creepy look across their face. A look I like to best describe as a sort of ooh-la-la, look what we found kind of facial expression. I remember instantly getting this really bad feeling in my stomach, and without acknowledging the two, I began to turn back and briskly walk back in the other direction, toward my uncle and the truck. At this moment, I assumed the two men were probably out doing some ice fishing or something, maybe even chopping firewood, because again they had the hatchet. But I then started to notice they're beginning to walk in the same direction as me, and they're gaining speed. Get her, was the last thing I remember hearing, before suddenly these two behemoths are racing toward me like a couple of hungry bears going after their meal. Me not really being used to running in the snow, I'm screaming like no tomorrow, awkwardly pouncing through the snow, and just praying to the sky above my uncle would hear me. Well, thank the heavens above my calls for help were heard, because my uncle was already on the way back toward me. This time, I see he had taken out his pistol he keeps concealed out of his holster, and he has it firmly grasped in his left hand. Suddenly, I hear the footsteps behind me come to a halt as I reach my uncle, who has this look of anger I had never seen before in my life. My uncle proceeds to yell at the two men, who basically tucked their tails between their legs and booked it back in the opposite direction without saying another word. Me, panicked, scared, on the verge of crying and throwing up, is quickly escorted back to the truck, where my uncle and I finally leave and make a full escape. Now, I was kind of expecting my uncle to yell at me and tell me how I should have listened to what he said, but he actually felt bad and apologized to which I told him it was no fault of his own. After all, you don't expect to just be doing some filming in the middle of a snowfall, only for these two complete randoms to come chasing you. To this day, I can only imagine what those men had in mind, and what they might have tried doing had they reached me. Truth is, they had bad intentions, and if it weren't for my uncle coming to the rescue and scaring them off, I might not have been able to share my story. My best word of advice to you all, though it should be obvious, when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have the option of being alone, don't. Always have somebody by your side, because the last thing you want is to be in a situation such as mine. Edit. I just wanted to add this. It's not part of my story, but I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Creepy Fox, for doing what you do. Your videos are a huge help to me, and they really help with coping with life's many struggles. Stay safe, my friend, and blessings to you, your family, and even your animation team you work with, the voice actresses, and the animator. Please give them my warm regards, as my little sister and I are real huge fans of your Aria Rose project. My sister really loves Aria. Meanwhile, I really love Tiana. Anyways... Looking forward to what's to come. Hey there friends, it's the Creepy Fox here. Just really quickly before we get on with the video, I just wanted to let you all know that in case you didn't know, I'm currently organizing a charity for St. Jude. We're trying to raise money and funds to help find cures for 
both common and rare diseases. Now, if this is something that you're interested in, you want to go ahead and help us out, check right below the video player. Even just a dollar goes a long way, and I kind of figured that, you know, this is kind of a nice way for all of us to come together in the Creepy Fox family and do some good and raise some money. So yeah, uh, go ahead and check that out. Yeah, but other than that, let's continue on with today's video. Just a friendly face, right? This happened in January 2013, when I was 27 years old. For some context, I'm male, live in northern PA, and work as a cashier for a small grocery chain. I still work there today, even through the current circumstances, and luckily I'm getting full time. On the winter evening in question, which I'm sharing to you all today, I had a pretty rough shift. Normally, I can handle rude customers who might be angry if we're out of a certain product, or are having a rough day themselves, only for them to lash out at us. But for some reason, these comments this guy made toward me were enough to throw me over the edge. Basically, he cursed at me because I refused to give him more of a discount than what was offered on the coupon he had shown me. I can't tell you how hard I had a hold in my range and just stand there with a fake smile, having enough of his outburst. By the time I leave work, roughly 8.15pm, I was mentally exhausted, and I couldn't wait to start what would be my three-day weekend vacation. My plan was to catch up on sleep, and then spend time with my girlfriend and her family. It's just a shame the start to this mini-vacation would begin in all the wrong reasons. And no, getting yelled at by a customer isn't the scary part to this story. So to get home, it's roughly a 15 minute drive. However, on this evening, since it had been snowing quite heavily, it was looking to be closer to 30. Not an issue, since I was actually going to go to my local coffee shop and pick up a warm cup of tea and a muffin to go. So I did, and with my drink and snack in hand, I decided I wanted to take the longer way back, roughly 45 minutes of a trip, so I could enjoy my drive and my tea. Now anyone who lives in rural PA like me knows that when you leave your town's city limits, it gets pretty desolate and quiet. This was a perfect descriptor of my current location, as I'm out in the countryside, listening to some Johnny Cash and singing along to his greatest hits, like The Ring of Fire and walk the line. Anyways, fast forward about 15 minutes and I'm beginning to turn back into town, when suddenly through the snowfall hitting my windshield, my headlights shine upon a figure that waves me down further ahead at the side of the road. It was quite strange, and as I got closer, I noticed it was a woman. My best guess since it was hard to tell due to her being all bundled up. Early 30s. Hey! Are you okay? I said with a voice of concern, as I slow my vehicle to a stop and she approaches my passenger's door. Here's what I roughly remember her saying. Yeah, I'm okay. I sort of swerved off the road and got stuck in the snow down here in the trees. Do you mind helping me grab my belongings and giving me a ride back into town? Now let me pause right here really quickly before I continue. Stopping for strangers at night in the middle of nowhere is probably the worst thing you can do. It is sad to say, but most times than not, you're falling into somebody's trap. Also, something else to bring up. She claims she had swerved off the road and into the tree line that was beside us. However, I couldn't see any vehicle, nor was I able to see any signs of a vehicle swerving. You'd also think you'd see tire tracks in the snow. Also, you'd think she might be hurt, but she looked as if she just got here. I asked her again if she could point me in the direction of the car, but this time around, she gets a little bit nervous. Before ignoring my question entirely, and asking if I could get out of the vehicle and help her. Now, considering it was in the low 30s, I really felt bad, and I didn't want to leave this woman out in the middle of a snowstorm. Therefore, I offered if she wanted to wait in my vehicle. I'd, of course, take the keys with me, so she wouldn't drive off with my car. However, she was insistent I follow her, 
and she didn't want to wait in my car by herself. Huge. Alarm bells are beginning to ring. Just to play it safe, I grabbed my revolver from my glove compartment, then I placed it inside my coat pocket. I then carefully stepped out of my vehicle, locked the door, and with a light from my cell phone, joined the woman as she quickly races ahead of me. Hurry, it's cold out here. My car's this way, she said in a rush, disappearing behind a large set of trees. At this point, I'm actually getting a bit scared, even as a 27-year-old six-foot male who isn't really afraid of much. Not seeing any vehicle, I call out to the woman, only for me to get a complete surprise. I heard footsteps and shuffling, and out from seemingly nowhere, these two heavyset men walk out, and they demand I hand over my keys and wallet, and any other personal belongings I might have on me. Did I forget to mention they're wearing ski masks? This was obviously a setup. I couldn't believe it, but the woman had actually tricked me, and all the alarm bells that were going on in my head were for a reason. In what was probably not my smartest decision, but looking back might have been my only option, I took out my revolver, and then I fired a warning shot into the air, which caught the men by surprise. They suddenly put their hands up, and they told me not to shoot. Whoa, relax. We're just joking with you. Put that thing away. One of the men says frantically, as both quickly hid to cover behind some trees, where just a few seconds later, I hear the woman chime in and say not to fire another shot. I took this as a, these guys were amateurs kind of response, but as not to jump ahead, I kept my eyes on them the whole time, keeping the revolver pointed in their direction. As I start to back up, I lose sight of the three, once I'm back inside my vehicle. I pressed on the gas, left, and quickly called the police, telling them about the two men and woman I encountered who tried to rob me for my vehicle. But let's just say I had a tough time getting sleep that evening, as I kept fearing, even though I know it wouldn't happen, the three would find my home and try to rob me. Police never caught those three, and since that nightmare of an evening, I refused to drive out of the city limits that night. Encountering the Real Life Grinch I recently found your channel after I saw one of your videos suggested next to a Let's Read podcast, and I enjoy listening to both of you. I actually sent in a story to him a few months ago, but there is another one I have yet to share. I wanted you to feature this on your channel. This was Christmas Eve of 2004, when I was in middle school. I can still remember that evening as we had been over at my Aunt Susan's house, having dinner, spending time with the family, and me playing with all the kids my age. At around 9pm, I was starting to get tired, and I asked my parents if we could go back home. We finally did, close to 10pm as I fell asleep in the back seat, and it wasn't until we pulled up into our driveway, I was awoken by my dad, who then carried me up to my bedroom. Fast forward to approximately 2 in the morning, and I wake up having the urge to go and pee. As a quick side note, we live in a pretty quiet suburb in a two-story house, with three bedrooms and one bathroom. My bedroom was upstairs, alongside the guest room and my parents' room, and our only restroom is downstairs. So there I go in my dinosaur pajamas and matching flippers, tiptoeing my way down the staircase and taking one quick look at the Christmas tree. There it stood, proudly, the lights on and all with its ornaments and its various gifts placed under some fake snow. I took in its beauty before focusing my attention back toward using the restroom. Now here's the deal. For whatever reason, there was this really cold breeze coming through the hallway that made me shiver. It was strange considering the heater was set to a comfortable 70 degrees, so unless a window had been left open, the cold air was unexplained. I figured once I was done with the restroom, I'd see if my parents had accidentally left something open. Anyways, I closed the restroom door, take a seat, 
and began to do my business. While I sat there, I began to hear footsteps shuffling in the hallway. It caught me by surprise, but considering it's just myself and my parents, I thought maybe one of them had gotten up to use the restroom, and that's what I was hearing. Three or so minutes pass, but nobody is knocking on the restroom door. Also, the shuffling of footsteps was heard further in my home. Strange, but I figured I'd go and see what the cause was. I leave the restroom, and then I start to make my way down the hallway toward the living room where the staircase is located. Right as I'm entering my living room, I bumped into a man in a ski mask, holding on to a large duffel bag. I remember going numb, as I saw he also has a pistol. Shh, be quiet. I'm not going to hurt you. I can still remember the man saying under his ski mask, as he quickly pushes past me, and then walks towards the kitchen. You bet I screamed like a wild hyena, trying to get the attention of my parents, who joined me seconds later down the hallway. What's wrong, honey? Are you okay? My dad said, trying to catch his breath. No. Someone broke in. I think we were robbed. My dad ushers both my mom and I into their room, as my dad then grabs his shotgun from the closet. He then does a scan of our property, and apart from footprints in the snow that led out of our backyard, he is unable to find anyone. Cops were called, and an investigation was started, but as I never did get a good look at him, nor did my neighbors or my parents, the man, or as I like to refer to him as the Grinch, got away. He made off with some cash, gifts, and a DVD player. Now let me explain a couple of things here before I end my submission. Remember the cold breeze I felt before entering the restroom? The source of that breeze? The back door in the kitchen was left open. It was actually unlocked. That's how this burglar broke in. The shuffling in the hallway? You already guessed that one. It wasn't my parents but instead the burglar. As for where the man was as I looked at the Christmas tree, he was most likely in the kitchen, so we never actually met eye to eye until I exited the restroom and stumbled into him. To this day, I will never forget that shh, be quiet line he did. It's something I will occasionally hear in my dreams, even all these years later. Turn around. You're not alone. Sure, looking back, I should have been a little more aware of my surroundings. But if it's a lesson I learned, it's that you don't listen to music when you're walking alone at night. Fair enough. Allow me to retell you this story that took place in 2011. I was attending an early college entry program during my senior year of high school. My goal was to get a few college credits at the local community college. It was about 20 minutes away from my high school. I was in a writing workshop that was on Tuesdays and Fridays. So after school ended at 3 p.m., I'd get on the bus and I'd go to the college campus until around 8 p.m. Sure, it was long hours, but it was well worth it, I'll tell you. On this particular Friday evening at my writing workshop, I ended up leaving at around 8.30 p.m., I stayed a bit longer to talk to my professor, however, but I left soon after. As I stepped outside, I was welcomed with a light snowfall and the cool evening breeze that pressed against my cherry rose colored cheeks. As per usual, I head to the far end of the campus, where I proceeded to wait for the bus. I remember really being into classical music during this time period, so I had my earphones in listening to my favorite compositions. After waiting a solid ten or so minutes, the bus arrives, and we begin to head to my stop. Along the way, we make the usual breaks, and on the second to last stop, a couple of older gentlemen get on. And of all spots, one of them chose to sit right next to me. Why? I wasn't sure. Still, with only about five minutes until we reached my stop, I figured I wouldn't mind them. Those, however, were the longest five minutes of my life. 
Again, I had my music in, so I didn't hear him at first, until he waves at me with his smile. Okay, well, I guess he didn't get the message I was listening to music. The conversation was fairly simple. He wanted to know what sort of music I was listening to. I told him I was listening to classical music, and soon left it there thinking he'd lose interest. He, on the other hand, thought this was an invitation to continue talking to me. So he started wanting to know more things, like my name, what school I went to, age, stuff like that. A bit annoyed, I gave him a random name and told him I was attending the nearby college. That seemed to answer his questions as he took out his phone and started to type things in. Not sure if he was typing the information I gave him, but I did my best to ignore him. We finally stopped at the bus station and I waste zero time getting up from my seat and leaving my creepy bus companion. But as I'm about to step off the bus, he joins me, and he says, Hold on. Wait for me. This is my stop too. Okay, so why did you need to tell me this, I thought to myself. Hey, I figured, since this is the same stop, we can walk together. What do you say? I told him my dad was around the corner, and was picking me up that night, and that was when he seemed to lose interest. It looked like it worked because he ended up walking down an alleyway, and I continued my walk home, albeit a bit on the edge. Now, to calm my nerves, I turned the music I was listening to up more, and I walked as quickly as I could. But as I'm approaching an intersection, however, I happen to notice the same man walking out of that alleyway he had just entered. Ignoring him, I proceed to cross the street, and I now head on over to the other sidewalk. Pretty soon, I became aware of some car headlights approaching me. I found it weird, until I started to hear somebody yell from said vehicle. I took out my earphones, and that's when two things happen. For starters, I turn around, and I'm face to face with the stranger from earlier, as he has a small utility knife in his grasp. Almost like the flip of a switch, the creep turns around, doing a complete 180, and then proceeds to book it across the street. I was left petrified and shaking as the woman who called from the car stops, and she tells me, I'm so glad I got your attention. I noticed that man had been following you with a knife, so I yelled at him and told him police were already on the way. I guess in me not paying attention, I hadn't noticed I was being stalked. Anyways, I thanked the woman profusely, and she ends up driving alongside me until I make it home in one piece. Unfortunately, even though I did file a police report, they never did catch the man, which really sucks because it ruined what used to be my enjoyable late night strolls in the snow. Since that evening, I've now moved to Texas, where I currently live with my fiance. Nothing really creepy or scary has happened in the years, but if something does come up, I'll make sure to share it with you in the future. The Man with the Axe For context, I live in Canada, and I'm 15 years old. I want to go ahead and tell you about a very frightening encounter that I had, which has given me nightmares. We rewind to December when I was home alone one evening while my parents were out doing Christmas shopping. I had already finished mine, which was why I opted to stay back at home. Things begin like any normal evening. At approximately 5 in the afternoon, I warmed up some leftovers, and I started to watch some YouTube videos as I worked on some homework. A few hours go by and my family still hadn't come back, even though they did promise they'd be here by 8 p.m., it was now 10 p.m., so I decided to curve my boredom by turning on one of my favorite movies, Jurassic World. 30 minutes into the film, I heard a light tapping sound at the sliding glass door. Now, before I continue, it's important to mention that outside of that door is my balcony, and there are approximately 20 steps to get onto the backyard lawn. Let's say you were outside and looking through the sliding door. Well, you wouldn't be able to see into the kitchen and the living room. 
So when I heard the tapping, I didn't pay much attention to it at first, considering homes have a tendency of adjusting to the temperature outside. The wood in the walls will occasionally create little knocking sounds. That's what I explained it as. However, a few seconds later it's the same noise, but it's louder. I decided to turn around and look at the sliding door, but I don't see anything. So I think about it, but I soon brush it off. I got up to use the restroom, and when I looked outside the window, I can see how much it had snowed, but that's not all I saw. I was able to see tracks in the snow, footprints to be exact. Remember, my family still hadn't returned from shopping, so I thought it was weird. I should also add that it only started snowing around the same time my parents left, so I knew for a fact it wasn't them. Even if it was, I would know instantly because those footprints didn't match the size of any of my family members. This person's feet were huge, maybe around size 13 or 14. The footprints started at the gate, up the stairs to my balcony, and then it had appeared as if they turned around and walked back down the stairs, heading toward the shed, where I see they had stopped. Now, admittedly, I was starting to get a bit freaked out. Just the idea of a random person possibly inside of the shed, I wasn't sure what to do. Would I have rather called the cops or my parents? I did neither, which is a very stupid decision, I know. That's why I put on some snow boots and a warm jacket with a metal broom in tow, and slowly I crept my way down the stairs. I stopped at the last step, however, and I thought, should I really go and check it out? All the alarms in my head were telling me otherwise, but I opted to ignore them. I slowly walked over to the shed, and I stopped at the door. As soon as I reached for the door handle, I stop. I take a listen, and I can clearly hear deep, heavy breathing. I remember stepping back and yelling whoever was in there needed to leave, because police were already on their way. Seconds later, there is movement, and the shed door slides open very slowly. Towering over me is a huge man, somewhere around 6 foot 10 inches. Worst of all, He's got an axe. We looked at each other for an awkward five or so seconds before he gives me one of the creepiest smiles I had ever seen in my life. I screamed so loud, hoping a neighbor would hear me as I sprint across the lawn, back up the balcony stairs, and locking the door in the process. I then proceed to run into my room, where I call the police, and the conversation went something like this. Hello? There's a man chasing me with an axe. Where are you? I'm in my room in the closet. Good. Stay hidden. And stay on the phone with us. We have already sent somebody over to your location. Okay. Thanks. He's in the house. He's in the house. He just broke into the house. Stay calm and stay quiet. Stay on the phone. I ended the phone call in a panic, and I had no idea what I should do next. I texted my mom the situation I was in, and they said they were already coming home. I could then hear the man moving stuff around, and breaking things, and looking through the room, slowly getting to mine. My room was at the end of the hallway, so hopefully he would look in there last. My heart dropped when I hear my door handle move, slowly turning I look around my closet, and I see my suit that I got in for a one-time occasion. It's hung up in one piece, the same height as me. So I don't hesitate to step behind it, and angle it just right enough to hide myself from when he opens the door. Almost right after I move, the closet door opens. I hold my breath, and I hear him sigh in anger when he didn't find me. That's when I could see red and blue lights on the roof. Then, I could hear him swear under his breath, and he leaves the room and runs out the door. I exhale, gasping for breath, and I run out the front door to the cops and yell to them that he's in the backyard, 
possibly hiding. One of the officers runs after him, and the other stayed with me, but I kept telling him that he's going to need help, but he insisted to stay. That was until we heard a loud scream. Finally, the officers called for backup, and they sprinted to the backyard, and just then, my family pulls up. I go to walk up to the car, and that's when I hear a gunshot. I didn't waste one second before literally jumping into the car. More police officers showed up, and they caught the man. They said that he was carrying knives, various substances, and a pistol. The police informed us that the man was on drugs, and they think that he wasn't all there in the head. All I have to say is that I'm very grateful that my suit was in the closet with me. Otherwise, things could have turned out so much differently. Nighttime Encounter Hey there, I thought I'd go ahead and submit my story. This was a couple of years ago, December of 2016, and I was 17 years old and a senior in high school. Now, normally after school, I would either drive directly home, or sometimes I'd go get some coffee with some friends. It's here we would either do homework, or just talk and hang out. It's a fun tradition we still do together, even in college. Anyways, I describe that because that was usually my routine. And this, however, happened over the weekend, so I was at home. On this evening, it was my mom and dad's wedding anniversary and they'd be going to dinner. I myself had stayed home with our two-year-old dachshund named Zoe. Strange name for a dog, but I always loved the name Zoe, so I gave her that name. Anyways, about an hour after they left, I decided I'd take Zoe for a quick walk. It was wonderful at first, a nice quiet walk down some of the nearby neighborhoods, with a light snow beginning to fall. I was a couple of streets away from my home and I was texting my best friend, and that was when I could hear my dog barking. I looked up, and this older man who appeared to be in his forties was standing right in front of me. Hey there, sir. Was there something you were looking for? I'll admit, there was something about him that made me pretty nervous. He just stood there, and when I tried to pass him, he would move and stand in my way. I just wanted to say I really like watching you and your dog. He said this with a really eerie smile on his face. Zoe then begins barking at the man, which causes him to take a couple of steps back. I start to back away myself, but he now starts to step closer. Immediately, Zoe and I take off running back to my house that was just on the other street. Looking back, it probably wasn't smart to run directly to my house but I really had no other choice. Just as I expected, I looked back, and there he is, still running after me. I did make it to my porch, and I looked back to see him standing next to the nearby street lamp. He's got this grin on his face that pretty much says, I'll see you real soon. I then watched from the window as he walks off into the dark, only for me to never see him again. Sorry, I know this was kind of anticlimactic, but having some random creep follow you around to your home, there is just something about it that gives me the chills. <laughs>